All right, and today is uh, Monday, November 26th, and we've just uh, wrapped up from our holiday weekend. Thanksgiving's all over. Black Friday sales are over. Cyber Monday's still going on, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so, uh, uh, anyways, so uh, now that we're back here, it's it's really time to get serious now about all this Oscar stuff because we're, uh, we're really coming up on, on the final bits here before it gets into the really, really busy time because we've got... Uh, Obviously, we have uh, a few things going on. We'll go through the awards calendar here in a minute, but uh, uh, I was going to give you an update here uh, just with a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, I've seen four films since last time. I, I think I mentioned this last time, but uh, unfortunately, I did have a, a relative of mine pass away over the uh, holiday weekend. Uh, well, before, but, but anyways. Um, so that really affected everything. So I was not able to see, like, I was planning on seeing Creed Two and Green Book, and uh, uh, see the front runner was playing, and uh, I was gonna try that uh, uh, Fantastic Beast sequel. I don't know. I didn't even like the original much. But anyways, so I did have an original uh, uh, plan to do that, but uh, you know that you know having somebody pass away, it's like really you know it really screws your plans. So. Uh, Anyways, uh, I wanted to do a quick plug here, and I tr I try to you know uh, wink wink plug for stuff, but I do uh, as I've mentioned a few times, I'm writing for uh, Cultured Vultures now for uh, for the award season and stuff, and um, I recently wrote a uh, kind of tribute to those who take us to the movies article, so I'm just going to plug that and uh, leave a uh, link in the description here. God, I never thought I'd use that phrase. <laughs> Sound like a professional YouTuber now, don't I? Anyway, so. Um, but yeah, that's just something I just wanted to plug quick, just because I, I don't know, I, I liked it, and I, you know, kind of wanted to pay respects there anyway. So, um, yeah, so I really quick wanted to get that out of the way, so I've got a lot of homework to do as far as stuff, because, like, Green Book is, like, probably number one or number two on my list of stuff that's out that I need to see. Uh, Creed 2 is right up there, too, because, you know, I've had a tradition, uh, I want to say the last, yeah, two years, um, three years, I think, 2015, 16, and 17, where Black Friday, I'll go down and see uh, see some movies. So I remember the first Black Friday I saw, oh God, I think I can remember them all here. I saw Brooklyn, and then I saw Creed, and, and then I saw Spotlight, and I, I think Trumbo was the last one. Yeah, so I saw a whole bunch of movies. And then 2016, that year I saw, like, I think, I think that was the weekend I saw Arrival and Edge of 17 and a couple of those. And then last year, oh shit, what did I see last year? Damn. Um, oh, I can't remember. I think it was Manchester. No, Manchester was 2016. Okay. And I can't remember what I saw last year, but it's like every year I've done that, and this year I couldn't because of that. So I'm planning on seeing those as soon as I possibly can, but, you know, with uh, with everything going on, it's... I hate to say it, but I, I don't know when exactly I'll get to seeing those films, but I'm dying to see, especially Creed too. That looks so good. Uh, and, and Green Book, and Green Book too, yeah, Green Book is uh, looking fantastic, but anyways, um, yeah, so that's stuff, that'll be coming, I've got, uh, you know, like I said, there were four other films that I saw that I wanted to quickly review, uh, a couple of them are uh, hanging around some Oscar uh, possibilities there, so yeah, we'll, we'll get to those in a minute here. Okay, uh, first of all, though, I mentioned uh, last time, because it was like right when the Vice screening was about to happen, and and all that. So since then, there's been at least one or two screenings of Vice for the New York and L.A. film critics kind of thing. Uh, to my knowledge, the screeners or any other sneak previews have not really happened yet. Uh, Vice is really at the stage where, like, uh, The Post and Phantom Thread were last year, where they're releasing in December, relatively sight unseen as far as um, festivals go. And they're just really relying on just open market kind of, you know, sight unseen kind of showings there. With, of course, a few critic screenings and SAG screenings and everything else to kind of get those industrial uh, uh, procedurals out of the way. So Vice, uh, I'll start with, and Mary Queen of Scots is the other one we'll mention, but we'll, we'll get to these here. So Vice, basically what I'm hearing, you know, word of mouth and everything is this is another winner for Adam McKay. Uh, pretty much two for two on his kind of more, I don't want to say dramatic, because these are both kind of, uh, from what I hear, you know, because Big Short was kind of a comedic drama in, in many ways. This, I hear, is kind of more of the same, but just with, you know, uh, another recent contemporary setting, if you get what I mean here, you know, kind of early to, you know, early 2000s, late 90s kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so Vice, you know, obviously everything I've heard is McKay does a great job as far as directing and, and he had a hand in the script. 
I, I think he was actually the only screenwriter on it, yeah. I know he had a, uh, another guy on Big Short. His name just flashed in my head, now it's gone. It's like Charles Randolph or Charles Scott or Randolph Scott or one of those one of those names. I think Randolph Scott is somebody else. But anyway, it was one of those, yeah, he had a, a writing partner on it. He wrote this one solo from what I uh, remember. Um, everything I hear is he's great. He's got a shot at director, but it's not a sure thing. It could be a repeat because we he did sneak in there uh, a few years ago for the big short. Uh, so it's a possibility. It's a possibility. He set that precedent. Uh, let's see. Christian Bale seems like a lock uh, to get nominated at least. Now he's got to take down Bradley Cooper, who's you know coming off of four nominations and zero wins, and Bale already has an Oscar for The Fighter. But he's he and Bale or uh, he and uh, Cooper. Obviously worked together on a couple of movies here and there. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting that they have to be pitted up against each other in the same category this time. Um, everything I hear is it's kind of a repeat of the uh, uh, Darkest Hour Gary Oldman thing, except here, uh, for me personally, I kind of, the first time I saw Darkest Hour, I was like, yeah, he's good. And then I thought about it more and I'm like, no, he was really hamming it up. And I, I think part of that was the script, part of it was him too. But it was it was a thing where I, I in retrospect looking back at that performance I don't think it even should have made the five last year for nominees. Ooh, I know I know that sounds rough from some of you, but it's like uh, for me last year I was thinking like uh, actually I've got this pulled up. If it were me picking out the nominees, you know I don't know why Josh Brolin was not nominated for only the Brave. That's one nobody saw, but he was phenomenal in it. Timothee Chalamet obviously I think should have been nominated. I put in Jake Gyllenhaal for Stronger, terrific performance. Jeremy Renner for Wind River. Probably should have won of these five. Uh, James Franco is my last one, but uh, I just like that movie a lot too, Than maybe more than some people. But anyways, um, those were my five last year, and it's like, yes, yeah, so I know that left out a lot of, you know, people that actually got nominated. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, so Gary Oldman thing, yeah, it, it's pretty much a repeat from what I hear there. It's just, you know, it's the physical transformation, but it's also a really good meaty part for him and, and all that. Amy Adams, I also heard very great things about in the supporting uh, actress category. And yes, as far as I know, there was no confusion on that. She's going to be supporting. Um, yeah, so, and evidently she's got a really strong part. Uh, not sure if she can take down Regina King. Not sure if uh, even um, uh, Claire Foy uh, might also stand in her way, too. But uh, we'll see. Um, unfortunately, I didn't hear much love about Sam Rockwell, though. So, uh, uh, the one thing I heard from, I think it was uh, Ann Thompson said, he's in it, but he's not in it enough. You know, you're always wanting more from him. So right now, you know, I, I'll get to, you know, because really the only category at the Oscars, kind of, I've, I've kind of updated after seeing everything here and, and reading the reviews, or not reviews, but, you know, statements about Vice and Mary Queen Scots. The only thing I've really changed around is the supporting actor category, <laughs> which is proving to be a very fluid race at this rate, but uh, we'll get we'll get to that in a couple of minutes here. But yeah, so I hear, yeah, Sam Rockwell's good, you know, very fun role as George W. Bush, but it's not a not a lock to be uh, even a nomination at this rate, so we'll, we'll see. It might just be a thing where Bale gets in, Adams gets in, uh, it seems like McKay's going to get in for screenplay for sure. Uh, possibly director, I've got it in for picture right now in that up to 10 slot kind of range. I have it number nine or eight right now. I'm kind of flip-flopping that too, but uh, it's in there. So, um, yeah, yeah, everything I hear is is it, it's it's another winner for him. So that's uh, good on him for that. And I, I am looking forward to that. I think I, I saw the trailer, you know, the trailer I thought was very good. And then uh, there was a TV spot I saw. Uh, I, was, I was watching one of the football games over the weekend, college football, I should say. And they had a preview for it, and I was like, damn, that looks good. Yes. Anyway, so I'm 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 pumped for that one. Uh, another one, Mary Queen of Scots uh, had a screening at uh, AFI Fest, kind of the closer there. Uh, it's eighty five percent or around there on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, actually, I can pull it up here to double check. Ninety five. There we go. Vox Lux is eighty five. Yeah, they put those two right next to each other because they both open uh, in very limited markets next weekend. But uh, yeah, word of mouth on this one is it's not a Best Picture player. It's probably not in for director or screenplay or anything like that. Uh, Saoirse Ronan evidently gives a, if it's not a career best from her, it's one of her best for sure. And she's been very good recently. Margot Robbie evidently, is, she's a lot of fun as Queen Elizabeth, but 
not a lock to be nominated for supporting actress. I took her out a while ago, and I took out uh, Saoirse actually a while ago. Now, Saoirse, I can see uh, she's got a very, I mean, she's got a lot of, uh, a lot of people to get over uh, in that lead actress category, which is absolutely stuffed this year, so... Uh, she's got a lot of, she's got a war in front of her, you know, kind of theme of the movie and everything too. She's got a lot of fighting to do if she wants to pick up one of those uh, five slots. And it's, uh, at this rate, you know, we can get into Best Actress a little bit too. I haven't made any changes myself, but um, it's like Glenn Close seems like a lock at this rate. Lady Gaga seems a, uh, like a lock at this rate. Olivia Coleman is pretty much a lock. Melissa McCarthy is pretty much a lock. It's just that that fifth slot is just a question mark. Is it going to be Elite Zapparicio, or is it going to be Julia Roberts for Ben is Back, who I'm hearing a lot of great things about? And that opens, again, in Limited next weekend as well, I believe. Is it Viola Davis for Widows, which I did see, and I'll get to that one in a minute. Is it Saoirse, or is it going to be something crazy like a Tony Collette for Hereditary, who's been nominated by uh, the Indie Spirits and stuff? Oh, Indie Spirits, yeah, I need to get into them, too. Uh, shit, that's something I totally looked over. Or if, uh, you know, Beale Street is still my best picture winner right now, if that really takes off, is Kiki Lane going to get that fifth slot? Or one that I saw, uh, Private War, Rosamund Pike, is she a going to be a surprise nominee? It's like, there, there's like, that's another, what is that, five or six people right there? I mean, good God, you can almost fill up a second category of, of runner-ups here. It's, it's crazy how, uh, how packed this uh, this year is. And, you know, I, should, I, I shouldn't say that, though, because, like, the last, uh, as far as number of, you know, performances in that lead actress category, it used to be, you know, years and years ago, it was like, oh, it was always a struggle to get to five, and you had to, you know, that's, you know, you know there's so many horror stories of, you know, so many performances here and there where it's like, really, that got nominated, or really, that got nominated? But it's like the last, yeah, the last two years, you know, stretching it maybe to three, there's been, you know, a number of, of great performances that, uh, you know, you have to whittle it down to five. And sometimes if I say it's an easy year in that regard, if it's like, if it's easy to whittle it down to five, okay, you know, that's that's what I mean there. But if it's like, yeah, there's those five, but there's a lot of other women behind them who gave great performances, then, you know, you know, that's, I don't think that's in any way a bad, a bad thing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, otherwise, you know, I still have it in for, like, costumes and production design and I think that's makeup. I have it in for makeup too, so I think it'll. It still has a shot. Yeah, those tech categories for sure. But it, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, still that ninety-five percent is a strong number for uh, for that. So yeah, we'll have to we'll have to see here. Okay, let's get into uh, before we get into indie spirits and you know what's coming up here because Gotham is tonight as well. I'll make a note here. I've got, I've got a uh, uh, if I can spell spirits right. I've got a uh, kind of list here, so I keep on track here, guys. Okay, so four films Yeah, I saw. This was uh, not Saturday, but the Saturday before. Uh, let's see, the first one I kind of gave away was uh, Private War. Uh, this is the, you know, Rosamund Pike plays Marie Colvert, I believe is how you pronounce her name. A uh, U.S.-born uh, correspondent for British Sunday News, or one of those, one of those papers, who went to Syria, went to uh, Homs, went to... Uh, Sri Lanka, where she lost an eye in a, in a uh, 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 I can't remember what the, so, yeah, it's explosion or some kind, yeah. Uh, I can't remember if it was like a, you know, there's, there's a phrase for it, but anyways. It was like a bomb went off or something, and it, you know, shrapnel hit her. Uh, anyway, so it's it's kind of a biopic-ish kind of deal. And I, for me, I, I thought her performance was fantastic. I mean, and, again, <laughs> In another year, a less competitive year, I think she'd be a shoe in to get nominated. At least I don't know if she would win for this, but she she'd definitely be nominated. Um, also, really good work from uh, the guy from Fifty Shades. You know, I talked about the other day when I saw Suspiria. I'm like, I think Dakota Johnson has kind of eclipsed that shadow that uh, the Fifty Shades trilogy kind of put on her career. She's kind of eclipsed that with that. And uh, for me personally, Bad Times at El Royale, I thought she was really great in. Uh, what was that other film? Oh, even Black Mass. She, she had a small part in that, but I, I liked her in that for the limited screen time she had. Um, and the actor's named Jamie Dornan, if I'm remembering right. Like I said, I haven't seen those Fifty Shades movies because fuck that. But uh, he was good. I mean, again, he was a supporting part, and he was actually, you know, for you know her photographer, who you'd think would be, yeah, easily, you know, have as you know close to the same amount of screen time. He was really background for most of it, which maybe that's the way it was in, in real life, too. But he was good for what he had. Uh, 
Yeah, my problem is the movie was only about an hour 45, close to that, give or take a minute or two. It just felt like there were some parts that were really rushed and then there were other parts that were really, really, uh, that they really dug into and really took time with. And it also had that, because uh, the director comes from making documentary films, so there's a couple uh, sequences of her kind of capturing stuff in hospitals, you know, right after... Um, um, uh, you know, people get bombed on and stuff. I think it was, I think it's the the Holmes stuff. Yeah, stuff in Holmes uh, that they uh, they show, and it's like you know the people are there, and they've you know it's like their legs are being blown off and all that you know all that fun stuff with war and and all that. So uh, they show all that, uh, and uh, you know, kind of the footage there, and it does have that raw kind of documentary footage to it mixed in with the narrative. Sometimes that works, and I know a lot of people complain about that, but I, I didn't mind it this time. Um, you know, I don't see a ton of those uh, kind of docs where they mix in the linear with the, you know, raw footage feel, you know. It's it's not something that I, I typically go out to see, but this, I, I didn't mind it. Yeah, so really that was my only major complaint was just that, you know, there's this particularly, uh, there's a scene where she kind of starts a relationship with the, the Stanley Tucci character. And it's like, okay, they get one scene of setup for that, and then they cut to it maybe once or twice, and he's done. Like, he gets one scene where he's like, okay, we'll have an on and off relationship with her. And then he's, like, gone from the rest of the movie. And I know, obviously, the movie's focusing on her, but it's like, uh, so this guy was just a one-night stand who said he was a long-term boyfriend? Oh, okay. No, not really. Kind of. I mean, they just didn't really make that clear. And, yeah, again, there were a couple parts here and there that just felt like really rushed and other parts that I felt kind of, not that they dragged, but just that, um, you know, they, they dug in a, li a little deeper and it's like, you almost wish that this was like a two hour, either right at two hours or a little over two hours where you could really kind of explore this and kind of see, cause you know, obviously like I said, Rosamund Pike is fantastic in this. I think she really captured the fact that this is a, a woman who, was, you know, kind of shell-shocked and horrified by everything she saw, but at the same time would have been more horrified uh, if she had stayed back and not done it because she was kind of, you know, uh, uh, tempted and very uh, addicted to her to her job and kind of the tortured soul that she was in that way I thought was a brilliant, brilliant uh, portrayal of that. So it's not, I mean, it's not like in my top ten of the year or anything, but it's definitely one... If it's still playing, because I know it didn't, it didn't do terrific when it expanded into the uh, kind of semi-wide uh, release. There, it uh, didn't really pick up. So that's that's one maybe you can look for when it comes to Redbox and stuff. That I, I liked it. Uh, next one I did not like, and that was Girl in the Spider's Web. Oof, oof. Uh, I I think I've mentioned it before. If not, uh, over the you know up to this last summer, I've been reading the uh, Millennium trilogy by uh, uh, Lars. Oh, God, I can't remember his name now. The guy who wrote the original Millennium Trilogy, you know, Swedish guy. And uh, and I've seen the uh, the David Fincher film. I've not seen any of the three Swedish original films, but it's on my list of stuff to see. Uh, anyways, but I was, I was looking forward to this. It's Fede Alvarez, who's coming off of uh, Don't Breathe and Evil Dead remake, which I know another sin of mine is saying that the... <laughs> I prefer the Evil Dead remake over the original, but pff, I, know, I know, that's on me. <laughs> um, anyways, but, um, and, and, you know, just from his standpoint to kind of give him a little bit of backing on this, there were a couple, you know, there's definitely a lot of shots that are set up and stuff where I'm like, that's ah, a really good looking shot and everything. So either him or the cinematographer kind of share credit there, but like the rest of the movie, oh, it is, it is all over the roadmap. Cause like, I especially liked one of the opening scenes or like one of the, you know, kind of the scene that gets the film going is it's in the, I think the first trailer they released where she's kind of hiding in the shadows and then she tricks the guy and, and hangs him up and, you know, kind of takes revenge because he's just been a total piece of shit. And it's like, that's it. I'm like, yes. I'm like, awesome. I'm like, I want a whole movie of this. And then it turns into a, it's a Roger Moore, James Bond film, just, you know, in a modern day setting with a, with a female. And it's like, that did not work. And there's so many scenes. And I haven't read, I've read the three books. I've not read the follow-ups that they've done very recently. Uh, books, I should say. Like The Girl in the Spider's Web or The Girl Who Takes an Eye for an Eye, I think is the second one that's out now. But yeah, I haven't read any of those yet. So I don't know if it's, this was just the source material or if it's the film itself. But good God, I mean, she's a hacker. She's not a freaking espionage agent. It's like the stuff she's able to do 
I mean, I'm not going to give it away, but there's one scene in particular that is that had me laughing because it's it was so preposterous. <laughs> uh, it's a it's one of the early chase scenes. I think if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Which maybe you don't, because it's like I mean, it's only made like 14 million here in the U.S., so nobody went to see it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I in particular, yeah, just thought it was really silly. And for me in particular too, reading having read the books and stuff. They really messed up on the on the supporting characters because I thought Lisbeth, uh, as played by Claire Foy, pretty good. Now, obviously, the script aside, you know, I thought Claire Foy did a good job stepping into the role and everything. But good God, the guy that got to play um, uh, Mikael Blomkist, who's the the main journalist, you know, who's kind of he's kind of the main character of the first two books. In well, he's kind of the lead character in all the books, anyways. But kind of, he and Lisbeth are kind of co-leads, if you want to put it that way. But he's, uh, you know, in the book stuff, they establish him as kind of like a, a guy who's had some age to him, you know, kind of early 40s, maybe mid 40s, possibly early 50s. You know, uh, I can't remember if they specifically stated it in the book or not, but I, it's somewhere around there. And Daniel Craig, when they cast him in the film, he was around that age. And the original guy in the Swedish films, I believe, was also in the same age range as well. But this guy, I don't know what his actual age is, but he looks like he just graduated from college. I'm like, fuck this. <laughs> I'm like, Mikkel Blomkist you know, uh, credited journalist, you know, who brought down the, you know, the, the end of the first book and all that, brought down, you know, some media tyrants and stuff. I'm like, no way he's like a 29-year-old douchebag fresh off of his bloggers. It's like, come on, dude. And then Vicky Creeps as the Erica uh, uh, Berger, I think is her name, or Berger, I don't know, depending on the Swedish <laughs> pronunciation. She was just totally miscast, too, because she's like, you know, maybe a little bit older than the guy they cast as Mikkel. And again, she's a married woman, you know, kind of approaching middle age, kind of, you know, or over the hill, kind of, you know, around the same uh, age range as him. And she looks like she's, you know, maybe 30. I mean, she, it's it's weird. So that they screwed up on. And I thought, I mean, obviously the, the two actors, you know, uh, Vicky Creep's got like nothing to do in the movie. She was in like two scenes and she was just there for no reason, really. She didn't add anything. And even Mikhail Blomkus's character in this, and again, it might be in the book too, but good God, he had—he was just a lump. I mean, he was just not doing anything at all uh, relevant to the story. So I, again, I don't know if that's criticism of the source material more or if it's just the film, but it's like, good God, this was just, it was just a slog at times. And this was an hour, 50 minute movie, I thought. I, I just thought it was a little bit of a, you know, missed opportunity there. And again, it's it's too bad because I think this this had potential to it definitely and I, I loved all the trailers going into it and everything and, and good cast and everything else it's just ugh, yeah and so I did not enjoy that one um oh, if we uh, I forgot if we're doing ratings here I gave Private War eight out of ten I gave this one five out of ten because there were a couple good scenes uh uh there's one sequence toward the end which was a little more fun to watch but I don't want to give too much too much away but. Uh, but yeah, I did. I love that opening scene though of her getting revenge on that one guy. And it's again, it's like, show me another hour, forty minutes of this, and I'll be happy. But it, it's not. It's not. It goes into a fuck a doodle whatever plot. But anyways, um, yeah. Uh, the next one I enjoyed a lot though, and I, it's uh, it's in the more toward the bottom of my top ten list right now of the year, and that's Widows, uh, Steve uh, Stephen Queen's film. Good God, he knows how to make a movie. Really good movie. Uh, it's, I really, really top to bottom, I think this was a well-made film. I mean, editing was great. Uh, the action scenes, you know, kind of action scenes, you know, heist scenes were, were really well done. Um, and I liked uh, I liked the cast, again, pretty much top to bottom. You got, like, Viola Davis, who's always great. Uh, Elizabeth Debicki, who was really fun. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez had a few good scenes where she's not just given the one look that she's, you know, the, the, I'm kind of pissed off, but I'm also trying to look sexy look that is pretty much her entire career up to this point, you know, Avatar and all the Fast and Furious films. She kind of breaks from that here and there. She actually is given a character and she's given some stuff to do in the plot that, you know, shows that, yeah, she's more than that. So, you know, good on her for that. Uh, Cynthia Erivo, unfortunately, is kind of shafted, not really has, doesn't really have anything to do till the third act starts. Uh, too bad, because I, I saw her, I really, really was impressed by her first, work in, in uh, Bad Times at El Royale. Um, and again, yeah, it's too bad. I know, obviously, if they film them close to the same time, then obviously you can't have, you know, the same amount of screen time for both films. But, um, yeah, I like that. Uh, Colin Farrell, for what it's worth, his part, 
you know, pretty good, but it's just, I didn't really like his character, but I don't know if you're, you're probably not supposed to. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, Brian Tyree Henry was really good. Daniel Kaluuya was really good. Um, uh, who else was it? Liam Neeson for the small part he's got. He's pretty good. Um, uh, I almost wish they'd done more with him, though, just, just saying. But uh, yeah. Um, uh, same with Robert Duvall, too, though. God, he, he three scenes, and he's kind of out. I mean, there's one scene in particular where he... He says the F word like seven times in the same sentence. I was rolling in the theater. I was dying. <laughs> He's like, well, fuck you and fucking fuck, fuck. Oh, God. Just to see like an 87, 88-year-old Robert Duvall. Oh, God. That was that was so worth the price of admission. So <laughs> so if you're on the, on the fence about seeing that one, if that wins you over... Huh, good because yeah it's it's worth seeing just for that scene alone <laughs> um yeah so yeah but it's yeah like i said it's a good story and it's from the uh the writer of uh, gone girl who also did the script for gone girl uh gillian or jillian flynn i've heard both pronunciations i didn't really take that into account so i'm not gonna say if there you know how many twists and turns in the plot there are but i i had a fun time watching the movie i'll just put it that way um, cause I know there's, uh, I don't have time to get into it now, but it's like so many people have so many different definitions of what a spoiler is. And if you say there's a plot twist in it, all of a sudden it's a spoiler. It's like, I'm not telling you what the plot twist, uh, anyway, so I, I'm not getting into it, but anyways. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed the script and everything. Yeah. Viola Davis again was, was really great as far as, yeah, it's Oscar prospects and stuff. I had it kind of, it's hanging around that 10, 11 range for best picture right now. I don't have it in right now. I still have Viola in, but I can see a scenario where, you know, even though this is a pretty well-respected film critically, it's not making a big boom at the box office uh, at this rate. So if somebody else pops up in that fifth slot, it, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too shocked, but she, she does a great job for what it's worth. Um, and then Daniel Kaluuya though. Um, yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, let's see here, because I want to get to the supporting actor stuff, but we'll we'll get to. I'll just say I pulled him out. I'll just leave it at that, and I'll come back to it later. Unfortunately, yeah, he's again. He's he does great. In fact, I liked him better in this actually than I did in uh, For Get Out, where I thought he kind of he just kind of had that. I would not say stereotypical role, but you know that kind of horror, you know, leading horror role. And he obviously he did. I think he did fine with with the with the role and everything. But that was my big head scratcher last. I was like, why is this guy getting in when like Josh Brolin or uh, or especially like Jeremy Renner or, or Jake Gyllenhaal or not? It's like, am I missing something here? And you know, obviously, I, if I get it, if he's a very popular actor, then then yeah, that that's probably the reason why. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, uh, but yeah, personally, I thought he had more depth to him in this, and he had a lot to do and especially in the first act and then he kind of disappears in the second act he gets a big scene in the third act and then yeah that's about it but um but yeah i i for what it's worth i i enjoyed him in the movie for sure and i liked him better in this than his performance in get out but that's that's just that's just my taste anyway so um yeah yeah um overall that one's a nine out of ten i i really enjoyed it uh, the only thing, like I kind of mentioned, there's a couple parts, like I said, like Robert Duvall, Liam Neeson, kind of those kind of supporting characters, where it's just like, you almost wish the movie was another 10 minutes longer or something, where you could just get a little bit more with those characters. Do you feel like, obviously, yes, you want the main focus to be on the four widows and, and on their uh, developments and stuff and on their plans, but it's like, at the same time, it's like, there's some interesting stuff going on over here, and it's like, every once in a while, you'll cut back to it for like a minute, and then it's gone, and then you're like... Oh, well, I, I kind of wanted to know more about that, you know, uh, you know, and I get, yeah, again, the, the movie, the title of the movie is Widows, we want to focus on the Widows, but it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I just felt like there were some characters, like, especially like the Daniel Kaluuya, Robert Duvall, kind of those kind of supporting characters, Brian Tyre Henry, especially, because he gets, again, he gets a lot to do in the first two acts, and then he is like a ghost, the third act, and he gets one scene in the whole third act, and that's it, same with Kaluuya. Uh, you know, it's like, I kind of wanted to catch up with those guys again, kind of see what they were doing, but nope. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was really my only big, big criticism of it. And even at, you know, cause it's at two hours, eight minutes, I think. And again, I almost wish that one, you know, most of the time I, I complain about it being too long. This time I complain about maybe not going into depth enough 
on uh, some of the some of the other characters. But anyways, that's that was my take on it. Last one I saw was uh, Beautiful Boy, uh, Timothee Chalamet and uh, Steve Carell. I'll tell you what, this one, I was really digging it and really into it in the first half. And then, like a, like a light bulb went off in my head right at the, right around the halfway point. And I was like, oh, I see why this is not getting, you know, 90% on Rotten Tomatoes or 85 or higher. This is why. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Because, yeah, this is my big problem with it. Carell and and uh, Chalamet are great, particularly Chalamet. He, I think, he bests his performance in in Call Me by Your Name. It's a much more, you know, Call Me by Your Name. You know, they're two very different performances, though. I should I should note that too, because Call Me by Your Name was very much the kind of coming in, you know, coming of age, romantic drama, in that way. And it was, you know, there was a lot, you know, a lot of stuff bubbling up under the surface, kind of performance. Which I think is obviously the harder performance to pull off, because uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of facial expressions you can make, which can have different meanings, can have multiple meanings, especially in a in a film like that. And he pulled it off brilliantly. Here, he's got a lot of shouting scenes, a lot of confrontational scenes, a lot of scenes where he has to pretend. You know, I, I don't think they did it on set where they drugged him up or anything, but there's a couple scenes like that. And he again, he does a great job with it. And I'm. Uh, I, he's, I think he's definitely getting in. I mean, he, Mahershala Ali, and, and Richard E. Grant, I think, are absolute locks to get in for that supporting actor race. But, uh, you know, the other two spots, we'll, we'll see. They're kind of a little more fluid. Um, some, will, some will disagree with that, but I, that's, that's my take on it so far. Um, yeah, that's the thing. Unfortunately, that's my problem. With it. They're both great. And, you know, Corral does a good job. Unfortunately, he's... In a way, it's weird, because Corell has been campaigning in lead, uh, Chalamet's been campaigning and supporting. It's weird, because there's almost moments here and there in the film where, I, I, in my, for my money, they're both co-leads. But there's parts of it where Corell is definitely a supporting character, and Chalamet's the lead. And then there's other parts where it switches off, and then all of a sudden, Chalamet's the supporting character, and Corell gets a lot of screen time. It's very reminiscent of, you know, it's kind of a, you know, maybe unfair comparison here, but it's very reminiscent of, like, Al Pacino and, and Marlon Brando in The Godfather. And they kind of had a, a tough time with that one, too, because Brando obviously gets a lot to do in the first act of, of Godfather. Then he's a ghost through the second act, and then he comes back and has a lot to do in the third act. Whereas Pacino is a ghost in the first act, gets, you know, a few good scenes, and then he's, like, the main character in the second act going into the third act, and then, you know, he gets, you know, I don't know. It's, I always think of it this way. I think Brando's the star of the first act. Pacino's the star of the second act. And then they're both, you know, kind of co-heading, you know, kind of co-starring in the, uh, in the third act of that film, if that's a fair, uh, reading on it. It's similar in Beautiful Boy where it's like, except it's not as fluid because it's, you know, because Godfather is a, you know, linear story. This is kind of all flat, you know, all fucked up in the order. It's it's a very Christopher Nolan, uh, Man of Steel kind of, uh, you know, discon discontinuity kind of editing feel where, you know, we'll start here and then we'll jump back, but then we'll jump forward and then we'll be, you know, which for, you know, for what it's worth, I, you know, most of the time I hate that. I, I just can't get into it. You know, it has to be done really, really well. But this one, I, I didn't mind it as much as I thought I would. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the camel or the straw that broke the camel's back or anything. My problem with the film was, yeah, the first half, you know, it shows you, you know, all the stuff that goes with this kind of material. Where, you know, he gets, you know, first he's doing this, he's experimenting around with alcohol, and then he gets into some weed and some pot. And then he gets into cocaine, and then it escalates to crystal meth kind of, you know, stuff. Breaking Bad, you know, kind of scenario there. And it's like, you know, you get that, and it's like, yep, and then, you know, he realizes he needs help, so he, you know... Uh, detoxes, and then he relapses, and then he goes back into it, and so on. Unfortunately, that's the pattern for the rest of the film, and it does that two or three times, and it's like, after after that, you know, halfway through that second time, I'm like, oh, this, it's just going to be that film, isn't it? Yeah. Which, I, I get it, it's based on a true story, and this is what happened, but it's like, uh, there's just an inescapable um, predictability to it, that uh, unfortunately, even the best performances can't really... Uh, can't really avoid that unless it's a unless it's a very well written script too, uh, which unfortunately this script was not as strong as as uh, you know as I was maybe thinking it would be. 
Um, anyway, so yeah, but yeah, I think, yeah, Chalamet, I think, is a pretty safe bet for uh, supporting actor. Carell is not a lock at all, I don't think, for best actor. Because um, right now I'm thinking Bale is safe, Cooper is very safe, Vigo is pretty safe. It, well, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I've heard a couple things. We might come back to Vigo in a minute. And it's like those last two slots are kind of question marks because it's like, okay, right now I have uh, those three and then Ryan Gosling in for first man still, but I know a lot of it's kind of the hip thing right now is to take him out. And Ethan Hawke I have in for first reformed, who's kind of become the hit thing to put him in. That leaves out Rami Malek, who's in a very popular film right now, Bohemian Rhapsody, which is really hitting with audiences and really, you know, very mixed with critics. Uh, then you got Willem Dafoe is still in there. Uh, you got Lucas Hedges in there. You got uh, you know some kind of uh, long shots are like John David Washington and Black Klansman and Steve Carell and Beautiful Boy. You know, so there's still there's still some uh, a little bit of room there, wiggle room for either Carell or one of those other ones to to creep in there. And for what it's worth, yeah, I thought Carell. You know, it's maybe not his best performance, especially with the more dramatic stuff. And for my money, that's still the big short. I thought, because Foxcatcher, he was brilliant in, and I was so glad he was nominated, because it was a real question mark if he was going to get in that year. I, I, that was another packed year for Best Actor. That's, you know, when Gyllenhaal got the shaft for uh, for Nightcrawler. Too bad. But, um, yeah, that's one that I was kind of, you know, it's like too bad that he was not going to make, and then he, he made it in. I pulled him out at the wrong, just the wrong time. But, um yeah, I'm glad he got in that year. And then he did The Big Short, which is a very different role, you know, had some comedic elements to it, but also had, you know, a couple really dark, you know, hard dramatic scenes, and he nailed them. And he really, that's kind of my go-to now for when I think of him him as a kind of dramatic actor. It's like Big Short. He, you know, obviously I know it was a film that got a lot of nominations at the Oscars, but that's when I was like, hey, they could have gotten another one for, you know, if, he, if they'd campaigned, because I know Bale was supporting that year, they kind of didn't really have a lead character. They were all kind of campaigning and supporting from what I remember. I could be, I don't know, I might be wrong about that. But it's like, Carell, if he had campaigned for lead for that, he might have gotten in. I mean, he was nominated at the Globes for lead actor comedy, but, you know, that was, pff, it's lead actor comedy. I mean, anybody can get into that. Um, so, um, so yeah, yeah, that's uh, my feelings on that. So is he better here? No, no I, don't, I don't think so, but um, anyways. And I think part of it had to do with the screen time, too. But anyways, so that one I gave a 7 out of 10. The performances are strong. Some of the, the direction, I thought, actually, uh, that's the guy who did uh, Broken Circle Breakdown. Um, uh, his name is, is like a... Uh, <laughs> it's a memorable name, but it's not coming to me right now. It's like uh, something... No, that's the guy who shot Dunkirk. I don't know. I was going to say uh, the guy who shot Dunkirk, whose name is also escaping me, but uh, it's like... Uh, some Felix Van Gorgen or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I'm taking a shot in the dark here. So uh, whoever directed it, yeah, there were some stronger directorial marks, but at the same time, it's like then it would keep, it would just keep slipping back into that predictable pattern, and there was just uh, again, it just kind of by the end you were just like, okay, you know, it kind of felt like the way I compared it was if somebody was putting in a a home movie because it very much had that feel of you know, you know, this really happened kind of not a documentary style, but kind of like a a professionally well done home movie. Like if you had a celebrity whose son had a birthday party, you wanted it professionally shot. This is what it would look like. Kind of maybe I'm out to launch on that. Maybe you have no clue what I'm talking about, but <laughs> it felt like that. And it's somebody put the tape in, put fast forward on it. And it's a 10 hour tape. And it's like, we have to see all this shit. And it's like, by the end I was kind of exhausted. And I, I, I'd seen three other movies that day. Typically I'm able to get through that, but it was like, by the end of that one, I was just like, Oh, thank God that's over. I mean, not that I, and again, I liked it, but it's like, just that there was so much re repetitive nature to it, and there was, um, you know, you want this kid to do well and everything, yeah, but at the same time, it's like, oh, come on, dude, it's like, you get, get with the program, so, um, yeah, so that was my feeling, 7 out of 10, it's, it's fine, it's, yeah, it's definitely not in my top 10 or anything, but, yeah, uh, performances were good. Okay, so that's that. So let's let's get back into it here. So I was going to talk about some changes I've made. So yeah, since word on the street is that Sam Rockwell is not given a lot to do in Vice, I've got him in the number four slot right now. I dropped him way down. I, I'm i not putting Mahershala at number one. And I'm not putting, putting Timothy number one. And I think this is... You watch. People are going to copy me now. <laughs> I know, some other people are probably doing it too. I'm not going to take the, the sole credit here. 
I've got Richard E. Grant in first for Can He Ever Forgive Me? Uh, and again, just for now, I'm not saying he's going to win the Oscar, and I'm not going to change my mind later. Obviously not, but uh, here's the thing I thought about it over, too. Richard E. Grant is, I mean, he's not a lock, but he's probably going to win, like, the supporting actor category for a lot of these, like, L.A. and New York Film Critic uh, Awards. If not him, I don't see, because Green Book, with the critics, there are some critics who are really not liking that movie. Uh, we might get into that a little bit here in just a minute. I haven't seen it yet, so I, I feel like I feel like we I, I need to see the movie first before I can state what other people are talking about. But just so I can, if I see if I want to jump on the bandwagon with that, or if I want to defend it, I don't know yet because I haven't seen it. But um, uh, I've heard a lot of different stuff, and a lot of it might just be puff articles that are trying to talk it up and stuff. Kind of what we saw last year. Hmm with uh, like three billboards where people puffed up pieces about it being racist and then everybody else jumped on the fucking bandwagon on that. Ugh, I, I've said my piece with it. I'm not going to go into it again. But I just, I just feel like there's some fucking dipshit, high on society dickhead journalists out there who, you know, just because their movie is not getting as much attention in the Oscar race, they have to break down the other movies. And it's like, it's fine if that's your opinion, but if you're doing it intentionally just to break up the race a little bit, I don't know. Sometimes I, I'm fine with that. Other times I'm not. This is definitely a time where, you know, like last year especially was a time where I was like, no, no, that should not be happening. Like I said, haven't seen this film. But right now it sounds like it's just puff pieces to be puff pieces trying to start a, a bandwagon against the movie. But I don't know. I haven't seen the film. I can't I can't be in the, on that band uh, on that bandwagon or, or defending the movie yet. I'm I'm not I'm not going to take a side before I before I go see it. So um yeah, from what I've heard, yeah, some, and I've read a few reviews too, where people are like, "Oh, it's it's very easy on race issues and stuff," and you know, it could have been harder on this, or you know, there were parts where the comedy didn't work. You know, there's reviews like that that I've read. So I think there's going to be some critics who don't are not going to be comfortable, even with Mahershala, from what I've heard, topping his performance, you know, Academy Award winning performance in Moonlight, and really, you know, being probably a career high for him. Despite that, and despite also Timothy Chalamet. I think there's overall, uh, Can You Forgive Me is at like 98 or 99 percent. It's around that range, maybe 97 on Rotten Tomatoes. It's a, I, almost nobody hates this movie. Everybody really likes it. And Richard E. Grant has been one I've not heard anybody say a bad word about it, performance wise and personal wise, too. Uh, because I know, especially nowadays, you have to keep that in mind. I know back in the day, you could have people like Sinatra win an Oscar, and it's like, if that had happened today, oh boy, <laughs> that would have been a hoot. But, uh, anyways. Uh, yeah, so I, I look at all that. It's like, he, it's very reminiscent of Mark Rylance in Bridges Spies, where he just kept popping up on all those lists of, you know, supporting actor. He won New York film critics and he won LA, if I'm remembering right. I can see Richard E. Grant getting on that same page and, um, and potentially winning the Oscar. Now I don't see it. Like I said, the Globes are a different matter, uh, with Mahershala because they owe him one. He did not win for Moonlight. So I think they're going to correct that. And I think overall the Globes are going to like Green Book maybe more than maybe more than the Oscars do maybe uh, as far as overall nomination stuff possibly uh, not a lock but it's it's possibility and they might award more Globes to Green Book than they they will give Oscars to Green Book that that could be true um, so yeah either him or Timothy I think are going to take the Globe it's it's between those two Mahershal I think definitely has the advantage there. Um, so yeah, I've got for the Oscars though. And I think for, uh, SAG, SAG is a tough call at this rate because Mahershala won SAG and his, uh, acceptance speech there, I think totally helped him overcome like Dev Patel who'd won BAFTA. And I, I know I was itchy on, on that. Cause at first I was like, I didn't really know where to go in that supporting actor race. So I was like two years ago. So I was like, okay, I'll go with Mahershala. And then Dev won BAFTA. And I was like, that's that's a very you know because like I, I kept back to memories like Mark Rylance the previous year had lost everything won BAFTA and then won the Oscar and uh, like uh, Christoph Waltz uh, for Django you know he was hit here and there he even he you know didn't even get nominated at SAG that year but he won the Globe and then he won at BAFTA and then won the Oscar so I was very much like that's gonna happen so I switched over to Dev and then at the last minute I changed back to Mahershala ended up getting it right but. Uh, Sag, I don't know where SAG's going to go, because, uh, I don't know, I think, really, of, of all these nominees, if Rockwell gets in there, and Mahershala gets in, they I think uh, Mahershala definitely will, 
those two are, I think, the only ones that are going to have that outstanding uh, cast nomination as well. Because I don't think Beautiful Boy is getting in for outstanding cast. I don't think Can You Forgive Me is going to get in for outstanding cast. But that would, that, I don't know. That might be a weird one that gets in. Every once in a while you have something like that or, um, or like The Big Sick or, um, uh, what was the, the, the other Vigo one that got in? Uh, Captain Fantastic got in too. Or Beast of No Nation. It's like every now and again there's a weird movie like that that, that gets in and SAG loves. And then it, it's a very surprise nominee. So, um, I don't, unless something like that happens. That would definitely, I think, help Richard E. Grant, definitely. Um, so I don't know where SAG's going to go. They would probably just line up with Mahershala again. But anyways, yeah. So for now, I've got Richard E. Grant, number one. Mahershala is my number two. And again, part of that is not so much on the movie, you know, or the performance or anything. Again, I haven't can't comment on it because I haven't seen it. But it's just the fact that he just won two years ago. And it's, you know... It's a very selective group of people that, you know, that go for two for two. Like, until very recently, Sally Field was in that group. Uh, he's going to remain in that group for the rest of the time, Kevin Spacey. Uh, Hillary Swank is two for two. Uh, Ro no, Robarts was nominated a couple times and lost. I was going to say Robarts, but yeah. Um, uh, there's one other example that's escaping me right now. But yeah, it's a very select group. Uh, Christoph Waltz, there we go. Christoph Waltz is in that group, too. It's like, um, it, it just doesn't happen very often, and uh, and especially not this close together. Like, Kevin Spacey had four years in between uh, Usual Suspects and, and American Beauty. Uh, Christoph Waltz had three years between uh, uh, Glorious Passages and Django, so that's closer to where Mahershal is. He's, he's only two years between Moonlight and Green Book. Um, and then you've got, uh, yeah, like Hillary Swanks was five years, if I'm remembering right, between Boys Don't Cry and uh, Million Dollar Baby. And Sally, Fe well, Sally Fields were pretty close together too, though, relatively, because it was like 79 and 84 for Norma Ray and uh, Places, Places of the Heart. So, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. It's like the more I'm talking about this, the more I'm convincing myself that it's it's more of a possibility, but... Yeah, okay, we'll see. Uh, I've still got Richard E. Grant just because I think he's going to ride that wave of uh, critics groups and stuff. He could win Critics' Choice, and then if he gets nominated at SAG, he'll, he'll get nominated at SAG, but if he can take down Mahershala at SAG, then I think we've we've got it figured out, but we'll see. Okay, then, yeah, I've got Timothee in third for Beautiful Boy, uh, Sam Rockwell in fourth, and I've got Adam Driver in for my fifth slot now since I took uh, Cooley out. So yeah, I still don't have Sam Elliott in there. And I'll tell you what, I'm maybe that's just my personal bias now. It might just be. I might just be looking at this wrong because everything, you know, obviously he's a Hollywood legend. He's been around forever. He's never been nominated, which is one of the few things that I have working for me for not putting him in. It's like, you know, this is a movie. Obviously, Star is Born is it's one of those films that could be the most nominated film Oscar morning. It could be. I think it's going to be the leading uh, nominated film at, at the Globes because it'll get a song nomination at least. Um, I've been in for director, picture, the two leading categories. And I thought there was one more. So I had those five. Uh, let's see. I did not have it in for screenplay. Wasn't in for score. God, I, I, thought, I, I thought I had it up higher than that. Yeah, I think I went through it in the last video, didn't I? Yeah. Anyway, so, um, yeah, it's. I think it'll probably be one of the more, if it's not the leading film, uh, Glo uh, Globe's Morning for most nominations, it'll be up there. Um, yeah, that's the thing. He's He is a legend. And he's also, campaign-wise, everything I hear is he is at every event and he's, you know, he's doing all the political, you know, political, you know, stuff you have to do, you know, the shaking hands, kissing babies, all that good stuff. So he's uh, he's really playing the, uh, the the ground game really well, from what I hear. So, again, right now it's just my personal bias keeping him out, just because he he is limited on screen time. That's the thing that you know Mahershala begs to differ for uh, for Moonlight only being in the first act, and even then it is a, a very much a supporting role in that first act. Um, he's got like four scenes, and I know two of those scenes are in particular really get a big emotional uh, reaction out of him. Uh, well, three, three of them. Uh, it's almost to that stage where I can where I can talk more about it and get more into it. But I know there's a couple people that are maybe watching this who haven't seen it yet, so I'm not going to give it away yet. But there's yeah three big scenes in particular where he really shines, and it's like that 
that could be enough to, to get him in. But uh, I'm still – that's the thing, though. Adam Driver is another guy, though, for Black Klansman, which I, I rewatched over the uh, over the holidays. I uh, had some of the family sit down and watch it, and they most part they liked it. Not as much as I did, but anyways. Um, I think I think it does hold up on a second viewing. Um, that's the thing. Adam Driver has been in a lot of stuff recently, and – there's kind of, I mean, it's small, but there's kind of an outcry for him to get an Oscar nomination finally. Kind of like, you know, similar but not on the same level as Leo getting an Oscar win. It's like there was such a, you know, Twitter thing over that. But it's like this one, it's like Adam Driver is such a beloved guy too. And it's like, and it's a movie that, you know, Black Klansman I think is going to be in the Oscar race. I mean, some people are doubting it still, but I, I think it's it's in for director. I think it's in for picture. I think it's in for screenplay for sure. Uh, from there, I don't know. But, uh, one thing I was, when I was rewatching the film, I was like, it's the film editing too. Film editing, I think is something we're, we're really doubting that movie on. I think it could sneak into film editing. Uh, it's, it's not a lock by any means. No, no, no. Uh, in fact, when I look, and I've looked over my predictions for film editing again, multiple times after seeing it. And I'm like, who do I bump out though? Cause I, I know right now the gold derby odds are favoring first man to win. I don't even have it in my five. I've got Widows, I've got Bill Street, I've got Roma, I've got Star is Born, and I've got The Favorite. And those five, those five sound like those could be it. Especially if, if Bill Street is uh, a more of a heavy hitter than maybe some people are talking right now. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> um, that's probably the weak link right now. I just have it in second because I think it's, it's the best picture winner right now. But anyways... But I think Widows, you know, it's uh, Joe Walker, I believe, is the editor there. He's been nominated a few times in recent years for, like, Arrival and stuff. He's a guy that I think if word gets out around him, I think he can win for Widows. It's a possibility. I mean, it's not a sure bet. But uh, Roma, you know, that's one I think they'll love. Star is Born will get in because it'll be one of the more nominated ones. And uh, it's uh, Jay Cassidy, who's been nominated a few times for like American Hustle and uh, Silver Linings, and I think he did uh, he did American Sniper, didn't he? I think. Um, or no, that was uh, that was somebody else. Okay. Um, yeah, so he's he's been around a lot too. The favorite is one. It's one of the Orgos crews, uh, crew members who hasn't been nominated anywhere yet. I think that one, again, is one... The Favorite is also fighting for that film that's going to have the most nominations. So, yeah. And then also Vice, you know, uh, a big short got in for editing. I believe it's the same editor on Vice. Green Book, if that's a big Best Picture player, I don't have it in right now. So that's another reason why I'm not going for it for Best Picture is film editing is very crucial for that Best Picture win. Green Book is another one. Black Panther is another possibility in there. Because, uh, again... I don't know if it's going to be a big player for Best Picture, but, you know, those kind of hyped up, you know, kind of like Mad Max and kind of those more blockbuster fare, if they really score in those top categories, like a lot of the tech categories go along for the ride, so film editing could be one of them. Yeah, then you get to, to uh, uh, Black Klansman and the odds there and stuff, so I'm just looking through. It's like, there's a lot of stuff. Film editing it could be a really tough category this year where we could see a lot of, you know, it... I think once we get to like the uh, uh, the Ace Eddie nominees when they come out, we'll kind of see where they go and kind of follow the tracks from there. But you know, there's I think there's going to be some some films left out in the cold there, uh, and it's yeah, that's tough. That is tough. Anyways, so uh, yeah, so those are my five right now. Again, for supporting actor, right now I've got Richard E. Grant in first, uh, Mahershala in second, Timothy in third, Rockwell in fourth, and Adam Driver in fifth for now. But I'll tell you what, maybe by the time I get this video uploaded, I'll switch it out and I'll put Sam Elliott in. So I don't know. <laughs> that, again, that fifth slot. And even then, maybe Rockwell is out and it's Sam Elliott and Adam Driver. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. So still some debating to be done in that category. Okay. Uh, let's see. Before we get to uh, anything else here, we'll talk about... Um, See, we've got all that out of the way. Now we can talk about what's coming up here. So we got Gotham Awards are tonight. In fact, they are probably starting... Uh, I don't know when I'm going to get this uh, video uploaded, but they're probably starting right about the same time that I'll have this video shot. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, the National Board of Review announces their uh, nominees and winners tomorrow. They have a ceremony in January, I believe. Something like that. It's, it's something like that. 
And National Board Review has been one, they have been all over the roadmap in recent years as far as predicting stuff. Because, like, let me uh, let me just pull up, I do this every year where I'm like, I just can't remember what they what they picked. It's like last year they I, they went for something that didn't matter or something like that. Let's see if the internet would work. Okay, let me see here. Like last year, uh, oh yeah, they put The Post um, as the best film of the year, but then they had like Downsizing, they had Baby Driver in there, and they had Florida Project, and Logan, they didn't end up with Best Picture nominees. Strangely enough, though, they had they had Call Me By Your Name in there, they had uh, Dunkirk, they had Get Out, they had Lady Bird, they had Phantom Thread in there, too. That's crazy. But they didn't have Shape of Water, they didn't have Three Billboards, it's weird. And then for, like, uh, Director, they gave that to Greta Gerwig, who was nominated, but we knew was probably not going to win. They gave Best Actor and Actress to The Post for Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep. Of course, Hanks wasn't even nominated. Uh, supporting Actor was Willem Dafoe. Supporting Actress, Laurie Metcalf. And those lined up with a lot of the Critics' Awards. Phantom Thread won for Original Screenplay, which was not even nominated. Uh, adapted Screenplay went to Disaster Artist, which was nominated for got, uh, Scott Newtstetter and Michael H. Weber. Uh, they, they had animated feature right with Coco. Um, documentary was Jane, which was not even nominated. Uh, foreign film was Foxtrot, which... Was that nominated even? I do not think it was. It was in the list of submissions, but I don't think it got nominated. Let's see. Special presentation at Toronto... It made the short list, but was not nominated. Yeah, so yeah, there. Yeah, that was last year. I, I know. Yeah, a couple of years ago they went with Mad Max uh, uh, to twenty uh, uh, fifteen. They went with Mad Max, which yeah, that was when our, I, I remember I was really like, dude, it's not happening. Like, don't set your expectation. Oh, <laughs> and then the rest of the year happened. Like two years ago they went with Manchester by the Sea. But they had, for the most part, they had almost all the other Best Picture nominees in there. They had Manchester, they had Arrival, they had Hacksaw, they had Hail, or not Hail Caesar, that didn't get in. They had uh, Hell or High Water, they had Hidden Figures, they had La La Land, they had Moonlight. So the only one they were missing there was, um, shit, what was nominated that year? It wasn't there, because they had eight nominees that year. It wasn't 20th Century Women. What was it then? Huh, okay, I've forgotten it. Sorry. Oh, well. Was it seven? No, they, okay, Fences was not in there. They had nine nominees, yeah. Manchester Arrival, Hacksaw, Hill or High Water, Hidden Figures, La La Land, Moonlight. Did not have Fences in, and they didn't have, what was the other one? Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. So yeah, like I mentioned, like they had Hail Caesar in there, that didn't get nominated. Uh, Patriot's Day didn't get anything. Silence got one nomination. Sully got one nomination. Those were in the best films. Uh, film went to Manchester, which was nominated. Barry Jenkins won for director. Casey Affleck won for actor. They got that right. Amy Adams was snubbed for Arrival, so she didn't get it. Uh, Jeff Bridges won for Heller Highwater. Uh, here he was nominated. Naomi Harris was nominated for Moonlight at the Oscars. She won here. Lonergan won original screenplay. They got that right. And they had Silence go for adapted screenplay. So, yeah, that was a weird one. Let's see. Yeah, we mentioned, yeah, like Mad Max and, and that stuff. Um, 2015. And they, they went big with, like, The Martian that year. That's right. It won director and it won actor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see here. And then 2014. 2014 was a weird one. Yeah. I remember this one now. Most Violent Year. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, look at, again, look at the rest of the nominees. Though. They had American Sniper in there. They had Birdman. They had Boyhood. Imitation Game. They had, uh, yeah, that was it, actually. Shit. Yeah, they had, like, their their list otherwise had Fury, which I loved Fury. Gone Girl was great, they had in there. Inherent Vice, which eh, is shaky for me. But they really like Paul Thomas Anderson, you can tell that. They had the Lego movie in there, which I was, that was one of the best films of that year, definitely. Nightcrawler, which was great. Unbroken, which, eh, I don't know what that was about. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, they had Best Actress, right, with uh, Still Alice, Julianne Moore, and they had Clint Eastwood winning director. That was weird. Um... Yeah. So that was a weird one. Uh, let's see. They went with her the year of Twelve Years a Slave. And Twelve Years a Slave was in, but it's like so. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm uh, where I'm getting at there. So um, 
Yeah, yeah. So every now and again, they'll get a couple ones right that we're like, at the moment, we're like, who is predicting it? And then it'll get in, like Phantom Thread last year or American Sniper from 2014. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll see there. Uh, no idea where they're going to go this year. Um, they kind of, it's kind of the younger crowd. It's kind of people my age, uh, kind of graduating or just getting into or just in the middle of college kind of things or just grad, yeah, again, just, just graduated. So I'm trying to think of the hip films this year. Well, they probably, the younger ones would probably go for something like Star is Born. That'll probably be on the list for uh, some, I can even see Bradley Cooper winning best actor tomorrow if they, when they reveal it. Um, Let's see. They'll probably go for director. I don't know where they're going to go. Uh, they could, they'll they probably go with somebody like Yorgos, the favorite. They could pick the favorite for film, director, lead actress, supporting actress, or, if, you know, depending on how they, because I think they kind of categorize differently, too. So, like, they could go Emma Stone, lead actress, Olivia Coleman supporting, or something weird like that. You never know. Um, I'm trying to think. Okay, what else? Uh, Green Book. We'll see about Green Book, how they like that. Um, that'll probably get a couple nods. Um, I, I don't know if they've screened, because, like, obviously Phantom Thread and The Post were ones that were, you know, not everybody had seen at that point. So Vice and, you know, stuff like that is, is on the table for them. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, First well, first Man. that I think they've liked... Uh, uh, they didn't have Whiplash in that year, but otherwise they liked La La Land uh, enough to give it one of the best film nominees. Maybe Black Klansman. Maybe. Uh, this could be... Because Black Klansman has not... It didn't do very well at Gotham. Didn't do well at the Indie Spirit Awards, which I'll get to those in a second here. Um, you know, Spike Lee has... You know, I thought he'd have a much bigger campaign right now than he do, than he's had, but it's... Uh, right now, it's not looking good for him. <laughs> I'm still on... I'm still out on a limb with good old Spike, so we'll see. Um... Yeah, Beale Street, they'll probably like Beale Street. They liked Moonlight quite a bit. Uh, Roma, probably, yeah. Let's see here. Anything else that I'm missing here? Now, they do have, like, the year the Lego movie got in for uh, one of the films. That could happen with Incredibles 2. Incredibles 2 is a pretty popular movie, and especially yeah, a lot of kids my age, you know, we grew up with that, with that first Incredibles movie, and for the most part, the second one didn't disappoint. So, yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Well, obviously, Black... Uh, Black Panther will also be one to, to look for. I think the a quiet place. I think a quiet place could pop up on a lot of stuff tomorrow. Maybe not the acting categories. It could it could be a weird thing and win screenplay or something like that. It could. It's a possibility. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, I could see that one easily making the list of best films. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. That's one I'm thinking about now. It's like, oh yeah, duh. That, that could make it. Um, I'm trying to think what other kind of hip movies maybe that are not looking looked at as big Oscar contenders right now. Well, uh, Crazy Rich Asians is coming to mind here. Maybe I'm kind of I'm going kind of going through the list of stuff here. Um, I don't know what else here. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I named a lot off a lot of stuff. Um, anything else? Anything I have in for Best Picture right now that they could they could go with? Um, Let's see, we talked about all those. Can you ever forgive me? I don't know. I, that could win tomorrow for Sporting Actor. If not, Mahershala will probably take it. Um, nah, I would bet, okay, I would bet much heavier on Mahershala winning tomorrow for that, for National Board Review. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, that is tomorrow, and then that clears it out for November. Um, the, uh, oh no, we've got uh, New York. New York Film Critics uh, votes on Thursday of this week, so... Yeah, we'll get to that uh, on Thursday. Uh, I'm trying to think, just for me, time-wise and stuff, if I'll have time after tomorrow to do videos on these or not. I'm not sure. Um, let's see here, yeah. Uh, let's see, then we've got any Award nominations come out on Monday, uh, a week from today. We're probably looking at Isle of Dogs or uh, and uh, Incredibles 2 fighting out for, for that. Uh, let's see here. Then we've got like the Washington DC film critics uh, announced on Monday as well. It's like all these kind of smaller ones uh, kind of happen there. And then next Thursday, the sixth is when things really get big. That's when uh, Golden Globes uh, announced. So I'll definitely have a live video then. So uh, we'll get into that. And then uh, Critics Choice uh, nominees are on Monday the tenth. 
Okay, when is LA? Did I skip LA? Hmm. I'd say LA is the other big one. Are they this week or are they next week? Have they not announced it yet? Let's see. I know they went with like uh, Call Me By Your Name last year uh, for a tied for director and one film, uh, one uh, for actor. Let's see, uh, Get Out one for screenplay. Um, Otherwise, they, yeah, they went with like Laurie Metcalf and Willem Dafoe in the supporting categories. They gave Sally Hawkins Best Actress. Um, let's see here. Um, hmm. They gave score to Johnny Greenwood for Phantom Thread. That's one of the few, <laughs> not few, but one of the aspects I really liked uh, about uh, Phantom Thread. I don't, I'm not seeing a date here for when they announce. Um, shit, I'm not seeing anything. See a whole bunch of stuff about last year. Mm, let me try something different here. 2019. Critics, no, that's Critics' Choice. I know when that one is. Last thing. Oh, here we go. Is this it? <laughs> I am just. Ugh, this is weird. No, this is from last year. Oh my god. Or is it? Hold on. Here we go. Here I found it. December 9th. Yeah, so that's... Uh, was it even... It was probably on this... I I'm looking off a list from uh, Rotten Tomatoes here. They posted this a while ago. It's probably on here and I just didn't see it. Uh, let's see. December 9th. Nope, they didn't have it on there. Okay. Yeah, so okay, so LA is December 9th, um, and then Critics' Choice nominees are the next day. Screen Actors Guild is on Wednesday the 12th, and then there's like Las Vegas, Boston, all that. Uh, you know, every major city or major state, you know, pretty much every state actually, gets, uh, gets their vote in uh, through the uh, end of December, early January. Uh, and then there's uh, the Oscar shortlist will be announced on Monday the 17th. So that's stuff for like animated, fe or not animated, sorry, foreign language film. That'll be stuff for like the makeup category and visual effects and some of those categories we'll, we'll find out. So yeah, and then from there, we'll obviously we'll get into, you know, January and, and we'll have more of the film critics prizes and stuff. So yeah, it's, you know, this is kind of the warm up lap here is when we get into National Board Review in New York and and a few of those, and Annie Awards and stuff, uh, before we get into Globes. And Globes are, are really early this year, so, yeah. Okay. So that's that. Um, let's see. Yeah, New York. I've got uh, Gold Derby opened up a predictions uh, panel for that. Uh, I can't remember what I put down. Um, I might change my mind since, uh, since then. I have Roma winning for picture. That sounds like an easy bet. Uh, I think Ethan Hawke. Okay, Ethan Hawke, I think, is going to turn up on a lot of lists for Best Actor for a lot of these film critic societies. I don't know about National Border Review. Possibly, but not a guaranteed lock by any means. Um, I think they would rather go with, yeah, like tomorrow they would go with somebody like a Bradley Cooper or Christian Bale or Vigo or maybe even Willem Dafoe, too. Uh, let's see, and then I have Alfonso winning for director at uh, New York and Glenn Close winning actress, but they could go with Gilead Saparicio. Or Olivia Coleman too. Uh, they could go with. I, I, I think I, yeah, I pointed out Richard E. Grant for Can You Forgive Me. Um, I think Regina King, supporting actress, is a safe bet for now. Um, either Black Klansman, The Favorite, or First Reformed for screenplay. Because yeah, that's another one. Uh, uh, First Reformed is popping up in a lot of screenplay categories, and I have it in for original screenplay right now. That that could take home a couple of prizes from critics. It could. Okay, so all that's out of the way. Uh, let me get to, uh, quickly, we'll go down, because we did the uh, the calendar there. Let's go to the Indie Spirit Award uh, nominees here. 
because uh, we didn't get to them yet. Uh, they announced uh, not too long after I did my uh, last video there. So we're going to go through those really quick because this, this is an interesting year for any Spirits because typically what we'll see is, uh, as we've seen in previous years, we'll have like Birdman and Boyhood and a few of those like that year or uh, Spotlight and a couple of those like Room, all those in 2015 and so on and so forth through the years. There are a couple heavy hitters that are expected to do well at the Oscars that will land a ton of nominations at the Indie Spirits. Uh, we kind of saw a little bit of inverse of that last year with like, you know, uh, um, three billboards and call, uh, not call their name, uh, Shape of Water were really nowhere to be found uh, on the Indie Spirits list last year. But that's where like Get Out and Lady Bird and uh, Florida Project really scored last year was at Indie Spirits. But there were, there's a lot of films on here, and particularly in the acting categories, where it's like, whoa, what are they doing here? It's like they really, really went indie this year. So we'll see if they either Indie Spirits is really, really early to the game, either they're really early here with getting a few of these in, or they're going to be on a totally different track than everybody else is. So obviously with this, obviously stuff like Star is Born and, and First Man and a few of those other big budget stuff, that's obviously not going to play here. So we've got, for the best films, we've got Eighth Grade, First Reformed, Beale Street Could Talk, Leave No Trace, and You Were Never Really Here. Interesting, I'm put my leg up here. Very interesting uh, choice here for these films. Um, as, you know, Eighth Grade I thought would do, you know, pretty good here. Yeah, it ended up with three nominations? Was it three or four? Uh, four nominations, if I'm reading that right. Um, so yeah, that obviously did well. Um, I, I thought it would do well here and at Gotham, but actually it kind of bombed out at Gotham. Didn't do very well. Uh, that's a lot. I'll, I'll get to predictions for Gotham here last thing. So <laughs> bear with me here. Uh, let's see, I've got fir uh, First Reformed was here. Yeah, that one I, I kind of expected after it did so well at Gotham. Beale Street really right now is, um, unless First Reform gets in for picture, which right now I'm not betting on, and I don't think Eighth Grade's going to get in for picture. I think that's going to be about it for, you know, possible Oscar nominees that are in at uh, at Indie Spirit. So I think Bill Street, you know, it, it helps it helps me a little bit because um, I'm not I, I'm not the only one, but I'm one of few people right now that has it uh, getting um, uh, the best picture Oscar right now. Uh, now tonight we've got like the favorite qualified at Gotham for stuff, but because it was not produced in the US, it didn't qualify for a lot of these awards for um, for in, for Indie Spirits. Same with Roma, so that's why those two are, are not on the list here. Yeah, Leave No Trace is one... I remember when it came out, it was kind of a big hoopla, and then it went, you know, like nobody really talked about it for a while, and now it's starting to really pick up again. Uh, it's out on disc now and everything, too. So it's it got... Uh, how many nominations? It got like four nominations here, too. Uh, three nominations. It got three nominations here at Indie Spirits, it's got a uh, similar amount of nominations uh, at Gotham. It got in for Actor, it got in for um, Breakthrough Actor, got in... I thought there was one other category it got in. Is it Breakthrough Direct? No, no, it wouldn't be up for that. No. Okay, so it got two, yeah, two big nominations there. Um, and then you were never really here, the Joaquin Phoenix one, which won uh, big at... Uh, um, can two years or was it two years ago now or was it no that was just this previous year um 2017 when it, when it premiered there was it can yeah it had to be can yeah uh and then it, it opened wide in uh or wide it opened in uh, april of this year so that's why it counts for this year so um yeah that's one i don't it's not on anybody's radar right now uh the director race very interesting we have deborah granick tamra jenkins and lynn ramsey Three female uh, female directors in this year, and they outnumber the male directors this year. I believe that's the first time, really, at any awards ceremony, ex unless there's a separate category for female directors, where that's happened. And that's wow. That tells you about the number of female directors out there. And uh, yeah, as far as I know, it's like Private Life is one I haven't seen, but I know it's one that's Tamara Jenkins. Um, a lot of people love it. Leave No Trace has a lot of fans, and you were never really here. You know, critically, I think, did very well. So, um, yeah. So we have those three. Then we have Barry Jenkins for Beale Street and Paul Schrader for First Reformed. Um, yeah, very interesting list there. Um, I don't know in that list who wins, though. Probably either Schrader or Jenkins, but... Uh, <laughs> 
clarify, Barry Jenkins, because you got Tamara Jenkins and, and Barry Jenkins. Uh, unless they go with, they could go with somebody like Deborah Granick for Leave No Trace, because she's, um, she's been making the rounds, too, from what I hear for, uh, for like, round game and stuff. She's been doing a lot of stuff, because I think she directed it, and uh, did she co-write Leave No Trace, or was she the... Yeah, she had uh, her and Anne Rossellini uh, wrote that one, so... Yeah, so she's got some skin in the game there. Uh, okay, the lead act performances were John Cho for Searching. Wow, I did not see that one coming. David Diggs for Blind Spotting. Ethan Hawke for First Reformed. Uh, Christian uh, Malieros for uh, Socrates. And Joaquin Phoenix for You Were Never Really Here. Probably Ethan Hawke wins that one. He'll probably win tonight for, for Gotham, too, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, lead actress, you have Glenn Close for The Wife. You got Tony Collette for Hereditary. Elsie Fisher for Eighth Grade. Regina Hall for Support the Girls, Helena Howard for Madeline's Madeline, and Carrie Mulligan for Wildlife. So this this is kind of weird, though, because, you know, I've, I've mentioned in the Best Actress race, you know, obviously somebody like Lady Gaga doesn't qualify here, and uh, Viola Davis doesn't qualify here. And obviously the with the favorite being produced outside of the U.S., that did not qualify here as well. Um, not at Gotham and not here at Any Spirits, no Melissa McCarthy for Can You Ever Forgive Me? And Richard E. Grant gets into the supporting category or just the acting category as we saw at Gotham. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's just weird. And the same, you know, could be said for, uh, John David Washington for, uh, Black Klansman where, you know, Adam Driver consistently has gotten in, but not the same for, uh, for John David Washington. So, yeah. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I'm just going gun close for, for that category for now. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's interesting to see, like, Tony Collette nominated there. Uh, especially, you know, because uh, that's something I kind of have to... There's always a few people that I talk to that are always, like, you know, big horror fans, and they always want to see the horror films nominated for this, this, and this at the Oscars. And I, it's, yeah, it's just the way it is. It's just, you know, unless it's Get Out last year, or Silence of the Lambs, or Sixth Sense, or Exorcist, or, you know, even Psycho landed a few nominations... It's every few years. It's like uh, when the cicadas come out, and a horror film will get an Oscar nomination kind of deal. So um, it's not like every year there's one or two horror films that really score well at the Oscars. It's just not not a thing. So and and uh, what I've heard too, I haven't seen Hereditary. It's it's a very divisive film too. There's you either really love it or you think it's stupid. So <laughs> it's uh yeah. So that's that's uh, the thing with that too. Which I know Tony Collette's a, a very uh, pretty popular actress too, and she was nominated for Six Sense. But yeah. Okay, supporting actor they had uh, Raul Castillo for We the Animals, Adam Driver we mentioned for Black Klansman, Richard E. Grant, uh, Josh Hamilton nominated for Eighth Grade, and John David Washington for Monsters and Men. Glad to see Josh Hamilton on here. He was one of my favorite parts of, of eighth grade, for sure. He, he did a very good job. That one, I think, goes to Richard E. Grant, though. Uh, supporting actress, uh, we'll keep going here. Uh, Kaylee Carter, Private Life, Tiny, is it Tiny or Tyne Daily for Bread Factory? I've never heard of her. Uh, Regina King for Beale Street, uh, Thomas and McKenzie for Leave No Trace, and J. Smith Cameron for Nancy. Probably Regina King, probably. Uh, screenplay, you've got Colette, Can You Ever Forgive Me, Private Life, Sorry to Bother You, and First Reformed. That's a tougher one. That could go with either, they could either go with Can You Ever Forgive Me or First Reformed. I think one of those two would win. Uh, let's see, first screen, there's a couple of like first categories, you know, special categories here. Real quick, we can go through those. Bo Burnham for eighth grade, you got Nancy, which is Christina K. Uh, Thoroughbreds, The Tale, and Blame. Sorry, I don't know a lot of these names, so. Um, yeah, um, probably eighth grade wins that one, yeah. I have to write something like The Tale, too, which is a, uh, um, uh, HBO TV movie. Obviously, that's not going to qualify at the Oscars. Uh, let's see, first feature, you had Hereditary, Wildlife, The Tale, Sorry to Bother You, and Leave the Animals. I, I, I can see him going with probably Wildlife for that one, because it's Paul Dano, who's, a you know, pretty, the most famous name of those five. Uh, let's see. Documentary, they went with Hale County this morning, this evening, Mining the Gap of Fathers and Sons, On Her Shoulders, Shrike Shirkers, uh, I think I can pronounce that right, and Won't You Be My, Won't you be my Neighbor. And yeah, it's that's going to be Neighbor all day long. Uh, cinematography, you got Madeline's Madeline, Wildlife, Mandy, Suspiria, and We the Animals. Ah, I'm glad Suspiria's in there. Suspiria was beautifully shot. And it's, uh, oh, I, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> the, it's the same guy who shot uh, Call Me By Your Name last year. Uh, I know, that was, 
cinematography last year kind of turned into a uh, not prediction wise, but you know, pretty full category for for last year. And Call Me by Your Name was definitely one that was in the in the hunt, but didn't end up with a nomination. So probably it, it was Suspiria. Yeah, that's not getting anywhere close to the Oscars this year. Too bad, but beautifully shot film. Then editing, uh, you were never really here. We the animals, uh, American animals, the tale, and mid nineties. That one I have no clue. Uh, cause there's like mid nineties is the most popular one of the bunch there, but it's prob that was the only nomination I had. Probably go with you were never really here for that one since it has so many other nominations. Either that or we the animals, but yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, like I said, so since Roma and The Favorite were shot, you know, outside of the U.S. by foreign filmmakers and everything, uh, didn't qualify for uh, a lot of these awards, so, um, yeah. So that's why you don't see, like, uh, Yorgos in for director, or uh, especially Alfonso Cuaron for director in this case, um, yeah. So they, but yes, yeah, st stuff like Leave No Trace, and You Were Never Really Here, and and that stuff, First Reformed, is sticking around in a lot of these categories. They are just really going indie on these. Like, really, like, they, if you want to classify it, like, there's high-class indie of, like, the stuff like The Favorite and Roma and, you know, Black Klansman and all those that, you know, the tip, t films like those that typically go on to get nominated at the Oscars and they're, you know, do very well. And then you've got that lower class of, uh, and I'm not talking quality here, I'm just talking, like, release and, you know, general box office and stuff. Then you got the lower class of uh, indies where it's that stuff like right now, like First Reformed or Eighth Grade, kind of, sort of, or uh, especially stuff like Leave No Trace, where, you know, they have a very select audience, they make some money, and then they're they're kind of done. And they get, yeah, a couple nominations here at Indie or especially at Gotham and stuff, and then, you know, they get the recognitions there, and then, you know, sometimes we see those directors really take off, and other times, other times they don't. Okay, so uh, real quick, uh, Gotham is tonight. Um, I don't think I'm planning on watching it because it's, I mean, not, nothing against the organization or, or the awards or anything, but it's just, it's just kind of there. I mean, they're, they're kind of in their own little world. I mean, uh, I think we, we pulled it up a couple times, but like Call Me By Your Name won last year, which, you know, was nominated, of course, and, and was, you know, early on was in the play for, uh, for Best Picture, but... Uh, you know, uh, then you had like, uh, you know, where you had Get Out, I, Tanya, and Florida Project also nominated there. Uh, they got Moonlight right, but that was at a point where it was like, you know, we didn't know that the La La Land backlash was on its way. Spotlight was closer, you know, in 2015, they got that one right. Birdman, that was one that I remember I, I did see that one because I remember Birdman was up and and, uh, cause like, yeah, best actor in that race, they had like, uh, uh, Birdman was up for Michael Keaton, which I, I loved him in that. Miles Teller was in it, of course, for Whiplash and, uh, funny enough, Ethan Hawke nominated that year for Boyhood and Bill Hader and Skeleton. Oh, Bill Hader and Skeleton, uh, twins. That was awesome. He also had, uh, Oscar Isaac in uh, most violent year. See, that's one, that's one where they went with kind of more of the high profile, uh, indie nominees, like. Whiplash was one that was starting to grow up by that time on the Oscar list for Best Picture. That was starting to climb up. Birdman, we, we knew was going to be in the race. Boyhood, we everybody had winning at that rate. Uh, Most Violent Year was one we had an eye on. It wasn't, it wasn't like a guaranteed nominee at that point. I think some of us, I don't know if I had it in at any point, but that was one we all kept an eye on. Uh, Skeleton Twins was the only one that was kind of lower, you know, in that lower class, if you will. But it was one that we we knew the title of, you know, kind of like Leave No Trace, kind of, you know, and then kind of similar with Actress that year. He had, uh, like, Gugu Mbathu Ra for Beyond the Lights, uh, Scarlett Johansson for Under the Skin, Patricia Arquette for Boyhood, uh, Mia Wasikowska for Tracks, and Julianne Moore, who won for, for Still Alice. Yeah, that's one, like, Still Alice we knew about, Boyhood we obviously we knew about, Under the Skin was one that had come out early and was a uh, big buzz when it came out. Beyond the Lights was one that we didn't know yet. Tracks was one that was you either heard about it or you didn't. So, yeah. So just yeah, just a couple of recent ones there. But anyways, so they don't always you know line up. But for tonight, I think uh, the favorite. I, I have the favorite to win. It's the favorite. Beale Street, First Reform, The Writer, and Madeline's Madeline are the nominees. Um, again, it's it's probably between the favorite and Beale Street, but First Reformed could surprise. Could surprise. Not saying it will, but it could surprise. 
Uh, let's see, Won't You Be My Neighbor is probably going to win documentary. Minding the Gap is my second place pick, though. That also got in Indie Spirits. And Shirkers is also in at Indie Spirits. And Hale County This Morning This Evening is also in at Indie Spirits. Um, yeah, and sometimes, uh, you know, Gotham and Indie Spirits, sometimes they'll break away if, if a film like that is going to win everything. They didn't with, like, I pulled up 2014. They're like, Citizen Four won that night against, like, Life Itself, which at the time I thought Life Itself was going to win, but Citizen Four ended up taking everything that year. So, um, so sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, let's see, the Breakthrough Director category, I have Bo Burnham winning that for 8th grade. I think it's it's down to him, Ari Aster for Hereditary, or Boots Riley for uh, Sorry to Bother You, but I think it's probably Bo. Uh, screenplay, I have going to the favorite. Uh, First Reformed is, is in the fight to get that. They might give it to it, but I'm picking the favorite. Actress, I'm going with Glenn Close for The Wife. Um... Got Catherine Hahn in second for Private Life. She's also up tonight. And then Tony Collette is also nominated here. She's in third for Hereditary. But, uh, yeah, I think it's gone close. Actor, I've got uh, Ethan Hawke. I think he's got it. Um, I do have Richard E. Grant in second place, though. If Richard E. Grant... I'll tell you what. Richard E. Grant wins tonight. That further solidifies my thinking on uh, on the critics' lists and, and, and everything like that. Because if... Correct me if I'm wrong... Did Willem Dafoe win last year for uh, Florida Project? It was either him or it was Timothy that won for actor last year. Oh, no, it wasn't. No, it was James Franco who won for Disaster Artist. Son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, the other two... Or, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 Timothy wasn't even nominated last year. That's right. Yeah, it was... Well, Willem Dafoe was, but yeah. So, uh, huh, that's weird, yeah. Okay, uh, Ben Foster, I think, also has a possibility, but it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, breakthrough Actor, I, I'm kind of, there's a whole bunch of stuff that can happen here. Really, everyone except uh, uh, Helena Howard, the other four have a legit shot. you got Thomas and McKenzie for Leave No Trace, that's a possibility. Elsie Fisher's definitely a possibility for 8th grade. Kiki Lane's a possibility for Beale Street. I have uh, Yelitz Aparicio winning right now for Roma, but... Uh, it's, uh, that's a tough one. That's kind of a, you know, spin the dial, Russian roulette style uh, to pick a winner there. Uh, let's see, then they have a long form. Yeah, that's TV stuff. We don't have to get into that. Anyways, so. Yeah, so yeah, so the favorite, I think, will pick up a couple awards tonight at Gotham, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple races we'll keep an eye on. Uh I'll tell you what, if I'm able to do a video tomorrow on National Board of Review, I'll come back to this and I'll recap Gotham a little bit and kind of point out if there's any, you know, <laughs> any big changes or, or what we're thinking there. You know, if something weird like Madeline's Madeline wins for film and and uh, uh, Lakeith Stanfield is up for Sorry to Bother, if he wins Best Actor or something like that. If something weird like that happens, then yeah, we'll, we'll get into it maybe a little bit, but uh, yeah. All right, well, uh, I've been here long enough. Uh, you guys are probably sick of me, so that's uh, that's what I got for now. Um, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll catch everybody later, and uh, yeah, we'll see we'll see how National Board Review goes. We'll see where Gotham goes. We'll see. Um, uh, yeah, we've got. Uh, I just named it earlier. Uh, New York New York Film Festival is uh, coming up uh, on Thursday, and that one I know they. Uh, that and LA both are kind of the thing where they live, they do it live and it's like, you know, one winner's announced and then it'll be like another 20 minutes and then another winner. And then sometimes it'll be like another hour before they figure out, like, especially the top category, sometimes they take a lot longer. So those I might either, I'll do a separate video for those or, um, or recap them in a, in a next video. So, all right, that's all I got for now, boys and girls. So. Keep having fun with this Oscar race. It's it's kind of a tight one this year, and we'll uh, we'll see where it goes from here.